Legacy Church. I just want to welcome Ryan Valley from Alpha. Would you make him welcome as he comes this morning? <laughs> Ryan has become a, a good friend of ours, and uh, he's working for, for Alpha, and we've been talking about Alpha now for, uh, I think it's probably about five or six weeks, but if you've been in this church for a long time, you know that we value Alpha. It's part of who we are. It's, it's part of our DNA. So in a sense, you, you, we know, right? But I, while Ryan's here, I thought we should go to the source, right, and get the real version of what, what is Alpha, Ryan? Can you just help us to know it even better than we already do? I, I just want to tell you, before I tell you about Alpha in any way, this is an exciting church to be a part of. From the moment, I, I get to see churches, you know, every week I get to travel around, and uh, there's some churches I walk into, and I'm like, this is an exciting place to be. And from the moment just driving here and being welcomed in the parking lot, wow, and the worship and just knowing uh, Pastor Nathan and who he is, this is a church alive, and it's an exciting church to be a part of. So I'm excited to be here this morning with you. What is Alpha? Yeah. What is Alpha? Okay. Uh, well, Alpha is a series of, of interactive videos uh, where we explore questions of faith and life. And uh, there's a meal, there's a discussion around the meal, and, uh, and, and, and the video. So uh, the, it's very simple. Uh, you might be thinking, you know, oh, I know Alpha. I saw it in 19... 19- 90, and it was fantastic, and Nicky Gumbel gets up there, and he talks, he's got a sweater, he's kind of nerdy, but that's okay, he's he good. He still has the same sweater. Yeah, I mean. yeah, no, that's true. It has been updated, but he's got a new sweater, yeah, and, uh, and he's got better dad jokes, I'm sure, um, and, and it's really, it's used around the world. It's just such an exciting thing, and it's got, you know, the Alpha Youth series, as you probably already know, and, and the adult series. There's an Australian edition now, which is quite Praise exciting. God. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Nikki doesn't do the Australian accent very well, but um, no, we, we got Do you some, do the Australian accent very well? <laughs> good I might. I, <laughs> I've been working on it for 13 years. <laughs> yeah, so that's what Alpha is. I can't think of a better way... To, to journey with somebody, to invite somebody. This is so natural. You know, you want to come and have a meal with me. We're going to talk about some of the bigger things of life. And uh, there's just no easier way that I know of. Like, use whatever works. I, I know I'm coming on behalf of Alpha. Everyone at Alpha would say, we, all we care about is seeing people come to faith. So use whatever works, but this is an easy way to do it, whether you're working in business or whatever sphere of life you're working in or, or sent into every day. This is a great place to, to invite somebody. Come explore with me. Why don't you come along? Yeah, fantastic. And something that we've done over the last couple of years is we've talked a lot about what's going on in our world, the culture, yeah. you know, the shift in culture that we've experienced and, and how, how do we interact with that culture and, and bring that message um, to, the, to this neighbourhood in particular. And so how does Alpha help with this cultural moment? Yeah, that we're I, in now. this is an exciting moment. It truly is um, for, for various reasons. McCrindle Research says that one in four would come explore questions of faith and life if invited by a friend or family member they trusted. One in four. It's one in two if you're below the age of 25. And yet two-thirds of the Australian population don't know somebody that regularly goes to church. Like they wouldn't even know where to begin to start to explore. Like where's a space I could go do it? No, there, last year alone, there were over, it was 93,000 Australian participants that we know of, those are the ones, there was probably more, that went through Alpha, exploring questions of faith and life. We're soon to pass the one millionth milestone in Australia. So this is the greatest season of evangelism in our generation. There's never been a greater hunger of people searching for, for meaning beyond what is seen, searching for hope, for purpose. And this is just an easy way to, to invite people along. And so, and I love, like, what the Wesleyan movement is a part of right now. There's never been a time that I know of, and it's got global attention where you've seen an entire denomination, a movement, saying we're coming into alignment together to run across our nation. And so that's what's happening right now. And Hills, uh, I just really believe that, that your faithfulness here to pursue and invite and share the gospel using Alpha is going to be something that that other denominations, other churches can see and say, hey, we can do that too. We want to be a part of what God's doing and how God's at work. And so I just really am excited. That's why I'm excited to be here. I'm like, you guys, you have no idea. People around the world are saying, what does this look like to run this through as a denomination? And you guys are really leading the way. So thank you for that. 
Yeah, have I mentioned that before, by the way, that the whole denomination around Australia? I didn't, they didn't know that, I'm so they sorry. They didn't know that? Yeah. Okay, so we're one you guys of, are doing it. <laughs> well done. Yeah, so yeah, let's put our hands there. That's good. So there is dozens and dozens of alphas happening around Australia starting either next week or, this, or soon after that anyway. And we're part of that. And we've been praying together, all the pastors, um, that, something, uh, that God will use this and something fantastic for his kingdom will come out of it. Yeah. I guess the, the, the remaining question, th this is the Hills Church that don't go camping at Easter, right, that you've got in front of you here. <laughs> all right. and, uh, yeah, and so what can the non-campers... Um, <laughs> how can they do. get involved in Alpha? Not specifically because they don't. Care, but how can they get involved in Alpha starting next Sunday? Yeah, look, I, I think it comes down to three words. And if you, this is all you remember, just forget what I say the next 25, 30 minutes. Pray, invite, bring. Just start praying. I mean, we, we realize that only God can, like, our, our job is to invite, but only the Spirit can convict and compel to reveal Christ for who He is. So the Spirit is the lead evangelist. We need to pray that God would make us aware of how he's at work in the everyday places of life and how we can enter into the conversation he's already having with somebody, that we can invite them to come and hear more. So start with pray. Pray for your friends. I always pick like five friends. Sometimes we have these praying for five friends cards that we, Alpha produces. We've used them. Oh, you've used yes. them. Okay, good. So uh, you get the A+. Plus. Um, <laughs> So I, I just write down five friends. It could be uh, uh, someone that's a neighbor, a, fam a family member even, a, a colleague, uh, a barista, a, a, a coach, whatever it is. I just write that. And then I just invite. And I used to invite kind of awkwardly, even as a pastor, because I'd be like, oh, we're doing this thing at church. You know, may, you should come along. But if you don't come, I'm not gonna, I, I won't hate you. I'll, I'll still like you. And, and by the end, they're like, did they invite me to something? I, I don't even know. So, so now I just you know, say, hey, would you like to come to Alpha with me? And I stop talking, which is hard to do. And I stop talking. And, and then I just watch and see how they respond. And they say, well, what's Alpha? Well, it's a video. It's a meal. And we talk about it. Why don't you come week one? I'll, I'll, bring, I'll pick you up. And, uh, and if you like it, keep coming back. And if you don't, that's fine. No pressure. You know, there's no cost. It's, it's all free. And just enjoy a meal. And, uh, and then just see how God works in that situation. So pray, invite them, bring them. Don't say that's a good thing to go to. You should do it. A lot of Australians have done it and like it. Like, come with me. Let's explore together. And watch how God works. Yeah, I like it. Can I pray for you? Please. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just, uh, we thank you for... Alpha, yeah. and the gift that it's been to the world. Uh, we believe wholeheartedly, Lord, that you were in this, this yes. program. It's not a program, Lord. It's, um, it's, it's a gift to the world. And so, Father, we just pray for this coming season and also for all of the churches, not just our denomination, others running Alpha this term, Father, that yes. your spirit will move powerfully. People will, their eyes of their heart will be open to you. And uh, many would enter the kingdom. Yes. Pray, I'll be praying now for Ryan, Lord, just as he brings the word, the message today uh, around uh, Alpha. Father, that you would anoint him in this moment. And uh, mm. likewise, our ears would be open and in tune. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Nathan. Well, this is Hills Church, and I, I was so excited, of course, to come. I'm like, what do you say to Hills Church? Like, they're already such an exciting church. They run Alpha so well. And so I was thinking, how, how do you, I mean, this is a place you can invite your friends to and have a confidence that they're going to have a great experience. You know, we're not going to put pressure on them. We're going to love them. But I, I, so I was thinking, what would you share at, at this place that's such a, already such a good Alpha church? Let me just to encourage you. And I just thought, maybe, maybe I'll start with this. Do you, do, you have any fan, do you have any fans out there of the sound of music? You're a Santa music fan. Oh, this is going to be great. All right. Well, a, a couple years ago, um, my wife, Beck, and I, we were traveling around Europe, and we made this mutual decision that we could each choose one thing that the other person would have to happily participate in. And so I made my selection. We were in Normandy, France, and they had this World War II Band of Brothers tour, and I had the best time, and I was, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, yes, I'm assuming my wife had a great time, like, I, and, and uh, so she happily participated, and then we got to this place in Salzburg, Austria, and uh, it's where the so-called classic Sound of Music 
<laughs> was filmed. And I remember uh, the moment my, eyes, uh, my wife's eyes lit up and, and she saw an ad. It said, see the sights, sing the songs, three hour bicycle tour. <laughs> She said, I've got it. And she assured me I would get some sort of like mountain bike. There'd be other men and, and uh, I could kind of hang out at the back. And, and we arrived that morning and there was like 20 excited ladies and me. <laughs> and, and I did not get uh, a mountain bike. I'm pretty sure I was given Maria's original bike. Like I got on this thing, I looked like a gorilla at the circus, and my backside was dragging. And, and this thing at the front, it had this basket from my purse. And, and it had a bell. And every time the bell would ring, it was like this warning that soon another song was about to begin. And I learned so much about women who love the sound of music on this three-hour circus tour. And, and I learned first, act like you're having a great time. Because they, they think you're not having a great time. They're going to help you have more fun with more participation. Secondly, they must train for this event because they know every line of every song, no matter how many times it was already sung that day. And thirdly, if you even whisper a few lines to any part of the song, I, I, I promise you, it's like throwing petrol on fire. Like they will spontaneously burst into song again. I don't remember how many times it was sung that day. They'll just, they'll just go for it. And, and I love being a guest speaker because I can come try things, and then if it doesn't work out, I get to go home and be like, Pastor Nathan, <laughs> it's all up to you now. <laughs> so I, I just thought this morning, it is, it is the morning, but it's Sunday morning, and it's the non-campers, so I don't know how the adventure is here, but, but I'm going to go under the adventure streak here and just have a go, uh, a little sing-along, and, um, and let's see how we go. <laughs> and and, and let's, let's see, get your best singing voice on, would you please? <laughs> if I say do, you would say Ray, now we're heating up. Me, far, we're hitting stride. So, la, T, and that will. Very good, very good, Hills. You got a worship leader leading the way. It's fantastic. It helps. I, I'm having flashbacks suddenly. This morning, I want to ask you a question. If someone were to ask you tomorrow why Jesus is good or why the gospel matters, what might you say? What would you say? How would you respond? I was asked that by a musician friend of mine who had nothing to do with the church, had no idea about Jesus. Said, Why is Jesus so good? Why does the gospel really matter today? And I responded like this. It's perhaps a bit like a love song that started a long time ago. Jesus is leading the way. It's changing the world. And we're invited to join along in that song anytime. Some know the words. Some will soon hear it for the first time. Some are just learning. But we're all invited to come and see, come and join along with what God's doing in this world. And of course, it's more than a song, right? This is the historic reality of Jesus stepping into our world's history to make a way for a destiny we can all be a part of. And he says, come, come. And we have a part to play in sharing that invitation. And so th this morning, I just want to talk about the power of an invitation. The power of an invitation. Where we can say, come and see. Come and see what God is doing in this world. And we're invited to be a part. You know, after the resurrection that we're now celebrating after Easter, Jesus gave his followers a commission, right? Matthew 28, we know it well. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end 
of the age. Make disciples. It's written in the imperative mood. So it has a sense. It's as you go about the everyday places of life, be about living out of this song, living out of this reality of what he has done for us. Make disciples knowing surely he is with us as we go. And we have this great commission, but I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read it and hear it, it seems a bit big. Like, this is a big task. Like, how do we go about even engaging this? And perhaps we're, we're nervous about sharing our faith so it becomes like background music to our lives. And maybe we think we don't have the right voice, so we don't know all the right words. So we'll just leave it to those extroverts in church. You know, the highly caffeinated ones, they seem excited about Jesus. We'll pray for them, we'll encourage them. Let's let them do it. But what if sharing Jesus was an invitation just to say with somebody to come and see? Come and see how good God is and what he has done for us. Explore with me this goodness. Discover Jesus. And begin to wonder what it would look like if the church began to take that last command of Jesus and live as if it was a first priority. What might happen? Do you know the power of an invitation? Now, I, I get to hear lots of stories of invitation, of course, with Alpha. And again, do whatever works. Like, it's not about Alpha. Alpha just happens to be useful at this particular cultural moment. Do whatever works. But I get to hear Alpha stories all the time. I, I love this one story of this guy named Adam. Adam was a pilot uh, living here in Brisbane. And uh, Adam, uh, during COVID, lost his job. You know, the plane shut down. And, and suddenly he found himself without work. Well, Adam also at, had a mortgage, uh, like, like all, most of us probably do, and, uh, and suddenly he couldn't pay it. And his marriage was already in strife. So with all these compounding stresses in, in his life, suddenly his, his marriage fell apart. And one day, Adam found himself quite suddenly living on the streets of Brisbane, wondering how in the world have I, have I arrived at this place? And somebody doing some ministry from a, a church down in the city saw Adam, fed him, gave him some food, and said, why don't you come back to church? We're, we run something called Alpha. You can come. We'll feed you. We'll, we'll look after you. We'll care for you. We'll listen to you. And he's like, well, I'm hungry. <laughs> so he goes back. And the pastor went on to tell me that Adam went week after week, and suddenly his eyes just lit up. He came to faith in Jesus. And he reported to the pastor, now that I've come to faith in Christ, uh, suddenly my, my problems haven't just disappeared, but suddenly I have peace. I've encountered Jesus. I have confidence in the future I have ahead. And Adam was getting his life back together. Story after story, this is the power of an invitation. One person saying, would you come back with me? Do you want to explore with me? He says, yeah. I, I love this one other quick story of Sheree. Sheree, I met her about uh, a year and a half ago now. She was at a, a Brisbane leaders gathering, uh, just church leaders. And, uh, and she is short and she is full of energy and she's just a powerhouse. And, and, uh, and I saw her coming from a distance and she, she's, she just pointed at me and said, Ryan, i got to talk to you. I've done time in prison. i got to talk to you. And I was like, well, you've got my attention. Like, well, what can I do for you? She said, about eight years ago, I was doing time in the women's detention center. And I was the worst of the worst. I was telling women what to do and how to do it. And, and, and somebody invited me to Alpha. And, and I was like, that's not for me. I don't want, that's not, that's not me. She goes, but they were offering cookies and I was bored and I was like, oh, what else am I going to do? All right, I'll go week one and just see and maybe I'll make fun of them along the way and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so she, she arrives and she says, week one, I went like this. And then 
week two, week three, week four. She said, suddenly I encountered Jesus, and it changed everything. She said, I, I was never the same. She goes, now, these so many years onwards, now I go back into the detention center. I run Alpha, and I help the women as they get, come on the outside and get their lives put back together. I've never been the same, but somebody gave me the invitation to come. I thank God someone gave me an invitation to come. How many realize that coming to faith is a process? There are steps along the way. And how incredible is it that we get to be a part of that process as they take a step of faith? Now, it's not just an overnight thing often. It's a, an invitation, a listening, a, a process. I mean, there is such a hunger out there, too. I, I've already told you, one in four will come. Explore. Those, are pretty, those are pretty good numbers. One in four. One in two below the age of 25. Like, the young people get it. They're like, we need a hope in the future. We need something more than what, we can see, what we're seeing on media. This is the greatest season of evangelism in our generation. That's when Nicky Gumbel says, I'm like, yeah, that's right. Who's going to be sent? How are they going to hear? Romans 10, 14 says, how can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? How can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? How can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone has been sent to do it? Well, God has sent someone. The body of Christ in our own voices, our own words, in our own ways. This isn't about our voice anyway. We're singing out of what he's done for us, not what we can do for him. When each of us comes to faith through relationship. I mean, how many of us grew up in the church and came to faith as a young person? Just, just look around. You've got lots and lots of hands going up. Well, it's probably the case that a, a parent, a grandparent, uncle, aunt, someone who cared about your neighbor even, said, why don't you come along? We'll journey with you along the way as you're coming to faith. And maybe you came to faith as, as a, an adult, but it's probably the case that there are people in your lives who say, these people were really useful. Like, God used these people to help me as I was coming to faith. And maybe you're here today, you're not even sure where you're at with your relationship with Christ. You're still searching, still discovering. And, and it's probably true that someone who cares about you has invited you to be in this space. So we each come to faith through relationships. William Temple once said that, that the act of bringing someone to Jesus is the greatest service that one person can render one another. And it happens in the context of everyday life. As we go, being aware of how God is at work around us and entering into those moments to say, why don't you come and see? Listen in more deeply to the good plans that God has for your life. You know, there there are three things that I find greatly encouraging as we, we step into this new alpha season as a church, but also just, just in general, like just a part of the great, the great commission context. The, the three things I find encouraging is this. Firstly, is this. God is already on the go. God is already at work in the lives of the people around us. We're not starting at zero. Secondly, it's the spirit that is the lead evangelist. No, our job is to invite. It's a spirit's job to, to reveal Christ for who he is, to convict, to compel, to move and warm people's hearts. And so our job simply is to enter into what God's already doing. So the pressure isn't on us, okay? The pressure is not on a pastor. It's not on Alpha. It's not on a tract. Our job is to be there with them in that moment. And the third thing I find so encouraging is that, that we have a part to play no matter how small it might seem. It might simply be those three words, come and see. Come explore with me. And you never know where that might lead. I love how Daryl Johnson defines evangelism, therefore. He says, we are entering a conversation the Spirit is already having with somebody. We are inviting people to listen in, to come and see, to, to listen into God's good plans that they have for the world and for their lives. There's such power in an invitation. There really is. I mean, Jesus often said, as you know, come and come to me. Come and see. And the disciples often said, come and see as well. Like, like they, Peter, uh, Andrew uh, meets Jesus. What's he say? You, you gotta, Peter, you got to come. As he goes to his brother right away. You got to come and see this guy. You won't believe what's, what he's saying, what he's talking about. Most 
invitations just have this, this strange effect where suddenly there's a moment of transition, of great power. Like, like most marriages started by way of invitation, right? Like they took one look at me and they thought invitation. I'm going to invite them to a park, a movie, something, coffee. Uh, most great adventures in life start by way of invitation. Like, uh, all the guys, like, if you're going to go for a big hike, you don't want to go alone. You're, come on, guys. We're going to have this great adventure. We're going to do it. Like, this is the greatest adventure of all. This is so powerful, so unique, so life-transforming. Like, of course we want to invite people along. Come and see with me how good God is and what he's done for us. Now, throughout the New Testament, throughout the Scriptures, we realize, like, you can see over and over again, we don't, we're not all gifted teachers or speakers, and nor should we even try to be. We don't need to be. But we each have a part to play. God has uniquely positioned us in the places we already live and we're already at, as salt, as light, to share good news, to be a witness to what he's done for us. And throughout the New Testament, you find over and over again, God is sending everyday people who have encountered him with courage to share. I mean, just imagine what it would have been like in that time when Jesus arrives. You know, Mark 1.14, he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. He's like, this is what I'm doing in world history. And all of his miracles are a foretaste of the coming event. He's saying, the blind see, the lame walk, the hungry are fed. Like, this is what it looks like when the kingdom draws near. Here's a foretaste of what's yet ahead. You know, a little sample. How exciting would that be? And what would you do? I mean, I know what I would do. I'd, I would start to pick the dream team. We, we got to get this message out. We got to, we need a social media campaign. We need a concert tour that's bigger than Taylor Swift. Like, we need to get the word out. We need the best and the brightest, you know, the best minds of our generation. Let's bring them together and, and, and start formulating a plan of how we're going to get this message out. But listen in how God chose everyday people to share this good news. This is his first round draft picks right here. Matthew 4, 18, as Jesus is walking beside the Sea of the Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen, as you guys know. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. How incredible is that? Like Jesus goes into this poor backwater area called Galilee, a place that even back then, people would make fun of, they'd say things like, can anything good come from there? And he makes his first round draft picks. He's like, I'm picking you. So right away, I, they're just fishermen. They, they, they weren't, it wasn't about what they could do for God, but what God has done for us. Right away, we get a little taste of that. You know, they weren't the best and the brightest at that time. If these, Peter and Andrew, if they were the best and brightest, you know what they would have done? they would have sent them off to, to Bible school, to Torah. And after years and years of studying under a rabbi, they would approach a rabbi and say, can I follow you? And here's a stunning reversal. Like Jesus goes into the poor backwater area and says, come follow me. I'm choosing you, everyday people, to share this most vital message I'm choosing you not to fish for anything else but for people. Catch people with this good news. And after the resurrection, of course, it's these same everyday ordinary people that went on to share this message. And it was so transforming of culture. I mean, this is, not, this is a no-no in, in Roman culture. You don't, you don't mess with cities. You don't cause an upheaval. And it's, it's causing a disturbance in the city. And so they get called into the courts to make an account for all the upheaval and those people coming to faith. Like, what is going on? And in front of the courts, while everyone's listening, it says in Acts 4.13, when the authorities saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, Ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. The same presence of Christ that abides with us here and now. 
everyday people who have encountered Jesus with courage to share. You know, if you're sitting here today and, and you're thinking, you know, I don't, I don't think God would choose me, just consider this for a moment. If you were going to pick, you know, somebody that seemed most qualified to be the greatest evangelist recorded in the Gospels, who would it be? Uh, you might think that it might be someone who went to the right education and, and, and you know, lived in the right postcode, right cultural background. You know, this, they've got their life neatly put together. You know, they've got two and a half kids. That's a dog. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, they have their life neatly put together. People admire them, right, in society. They, you know, they've done well. You know who the, the greatest evangelist is recording the gospel? You can read about her in John 4. It's the woman at the well. She brings her whole town to meet Jesus with three words. Come and see. I, you are a, a Bible church. You guys know your Bible. So I don't need to go into all the details, but, but just think about it. How incredible is that? Just some of the, the biographical information alone. I mean, firstly, she's a woman. And women in that time, in that culture, were not well regarded or respected. Their testimony in the courts of law wasn't even considered valid. And then she's a Samaritan. Like, they're called half-breed dogs in that culture. Like, they were the wrong people group. And then, if you read the story, it's the sixth hour. And the sixth hour is the middle of the day. This is a hot desert climate, right? And here she is, middle of the day, it's hot. That's not how culture would work at the time. They would go together in the mornings, like a group of ladies, they'd collect the water and they'd bring it back for the needs of the day. And here she is alone, sitting at the swell, hot heat of the day, alone. And maybe, that, maybe it's the case that she's a little bit of an outcast. And then you discover that she's had five broken marriages. Five times she's been told in life, you're unlovable. You're not lovable. And now she's living with the guy. And she's living with the guy because in that time, in that culture, if you weren't connected to a man, you probably didn't have security of food and shelter. And you can imagine her sitting at that well in the heat of the day, thinking, I had all these dreams and plans for my life. And this is what I was going to do. I was going to have a family. I was going to have kids. I was going to have a, a husband that loved me. I was going to have security. I was going to be safe. I was going to be loved. And here I am, alone, so thirsty for something more in life. And she encounters Jesus at that well. And she doesn't have her all of her theology, right? She's not got all the words to the song sorted out. But there's something about Jesus and his invitation. She says, I want to be a part of that. And she's so excited that she runs back to the town. And she says, come and see. A man who told me everything I ever did. He knows all about my rejection, my mistakes, my past, my brokenness. He's counting me in. Could this be the Messiah? See, she doesn't even have all of her facts put together yet. She's, she's discovering. She wants to discover further with them. In verse 30, it says the townspeople made their way out towards Jesus. And eventually in 42, verse 42, it says, they say to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. How amazing that God chose her. Every day, ordinary people. As the greatest evangelist recorded in the gospel. I mean, can you hear it? Over and over again, God choosing everyday people who have encountered him with courage to share. Courage not being the absence of, of fear, but a willingness to go beyond our fears because of something greater. You know, the disciples knew fear after the resurrection, right? 
They, they, the crucifixion, they, they didn't know he was alive yet. So they're hiding behind locked doors. They're thinking that they're going to be killed next. That's what they do. As soon as Jesus is killed, they go into hiding. But something beyond their fears passed through those locked doors. A resurrected Savior. And they were willing to go beyond their fears, to unlock the doors, to do whatever it took to begin to share that message. I wonder what it is in our life that holds us back from sharing that message. What locked doors we might have to say, what, what would it take to unlock that doors? Say, all right, I'm ready to go. I'm prepared to go beyond my fears to share the invitation, to watch and see how God might move and use that invitation ahead. What would it take to move our church? I, I, I honestly, I, I truly believe that God is already prepared to move if his church is prepared to move with him. I believe there is so many great things yet ahead. Like we're already seeing uh, an increase of evangelism and people coming to faith throughout Australia. But I think there's more yet ahead. I've never seen a moment such as this as a, a leader in the church where I can get to go around and see unity of, of people across the denominations coming together and saying, whatever it takes, we got to get back to mission and off maintenance. We got to move back into a pursuing of God's presence rather than thinking about just programs. Like we are going to see so many people coming to faith ahead, not only in the Wesleyan movement, but I believe that you guys are going to inspire many other movements. Say, this is what's possible when we say yes to God's yes over us, that we come into agreement with what God's already at work doing. I mean, this is, this is what it's all about. We pray, invite, bring. The, the church isn't a location. It's a movement of friends inviting friends. You know, Andrew, he meets Jesus. He gets his brother Peter. Come and see. Think about the, the four loyal friends in, in John 1. I'm oh, sorry, Mark 2. Four loyal friends, Mark 2. I, I, I just love this. I, every time I think about this, this, I think, this is what we got to do. There's the story of the paralyzed man on the mat, right? And they, he's got these friends, and they'll do whatever it takes to get them to meet Jesus. Like, Jesus is healing people. He's, he's changing lives. you got to meet this guy. And they'll do whatever it takes to get him there. And we don't even know if he wanted to go, right? He, they just pick him up, and they're going. He could have been protesting the whole way. Like, yeah, we need friends like that. And then they get to the house. They can't even get in. Like they're so packed full of people, and Jesus is in the inside. You know, he, they're all wanting to hear what he has to say. And you think, you know, at this point, I would have been like, well, we'll wait our turn. We've got our ticket in line, and here we go. And, and no, these are four of our friends. They, they are prepared, whatever it takes. They're climbing up on the roof. This is, this is hard work. And then they start doing something I never would have thought of. You're going to dig a hole in the roof. And they start removing the sheets. And the, probably the homeowner's like, this, what have I done? This is costing me something. And, and the dust and the, the muck. And I mean, probably pretty awkward too. That paralyzed man is probably protesting by then. And he's getting lowered down to meet Jesus. And I don't know if he wanted to go that day when his loyal friends took him. But I'm pretty sure when he walked out of their a healed, forgiven, restored human is pretty glad that he had four loyal friends that would take him there. We need this in our generation. What would it take that we would see us bringing our friends, that they would see such loyalty in our hearts that you've got to come along and see. Don't miss what God has in mind for you. See, I don't ever want to die wondering in my own life, what if I just would have prayed for my friends? What would have happened if I would have invited them? Like, what would have happened if I, if I would just bring them along and say, I'll, I'll take you. Let's explore together. And my fear is that we let the gospel become background music to our lives because it sounds too big. Like, it's too much for us. But God is inviting everyday ordinary people to sing in our own voice and our own words. And somehow missing some of the words and having some of the, 
the, the not right tones in our voice somehow only enhances how good God is because this isn't about us. It's about what he has done for us. Come and see. We need the whole body singing in our own ways. I'll finish with this story. I'll invite the worship team to come up as we finish up. Maybe it is that you, wanna, you had one of these given to you as on your seat when you walked in. Maybe it is that you want to hold it and, and think about your own friend as I tell this story of who you might invite ahead. It's a story of Albert McMakin, and I love this story. Albert was a 24-year-old farmer, and Albert had recently come to faith, and he was so excited, so full of enthusiasm, he began inviting all of his friends to come and hear more about Jesus. And Albert had this friend who was a good-looking farmer's son. And Albert was desperate to, to, to bring him along, but he couldn't persuade his friend. His friend was busy falling in and out of love with different girls. He was distracted, didn't seem to be interested in, in anything to do with Jesus at all. But one day, Albert persuaded his friend to come along to this tent meeting where they're hearing the gospel by driving the truck. He convinced them to, to drive a group of friends all the way to this meeting to hear about Jesus. And Albert's friend intended to not go in. He was going to stay on the outside and just kind of wait for them. But he did decide to go in after all and began to listen in. And Albert's friend began to have thoughts he'd never known before, he said. He was spellbound. And Albert's friend went back again night after night until one night he came forward and gave his life to Jesus. And that man, the driver of the truck, was Billy Graham. And the year was 1934. And we know that since that time, Billy went on to share the gospel to millions of people around the world. And God used him powerfully even here in Australia in 1959, in subsequent years. And I just wonder, is there anyone here this morning whose life or parent's life or grandparent's life was touched by Billy's ministry here in Australia? There are hands all through this room. There is not a church that I go to on a Sunday where I haven't asked that question, where they, I haven't seen hands go up. How incredible is that? Now, we can't all be Billy Graham, and nor should we even try. But we can all be like his friend, Albert, and say, come and see. And you never know what those three words might do and how God might use your moment of faithfulness as you share that invitation. Billy Graham once said, I don't need a successor. I don't need a successor. I only need willing hands to accept the torch of a new gener for the new generation. We are that generation now. And this is the greatest season of evangelism in our generation. How might we respond? Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and fill us. Awaken your church and your people. But this awakening starts in our own life. One person at a time. It's us. You are prepared to move. Are we prepared to move with you? God, would you open our eyes to see how you are at work in the everyday places as we go. Give us vision to see you. That we would enter into the conversation you are already having in the lives of people around us. Would you soften our hearts for the cry of this generation where lifeline numbers are off the charts. People searching for hope beyond what is seen. Where will they go? Where will they turn? It's to you alone who brings life, life to the full. 
God, send your people. Awaken us and move in our hearts. I pray that we would hear you in the midst of the distractions of discouragement, of whatever it is that has locked our hearts to the commission. And you would give us courage that it could be simply come and see. Come like a beggar telling another beggar where bread is found, where we have hope and a future that starts changing life today. Come, Holy Spirit. Awaken us for our generation that we won't die wondering what would have happened because we will see many come to faith ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.